<coughs> the title of my paper is uh, Cross Cultural Bioethics. Cross Cultural Bioethics, which is seen mainly from Indian perspective, especially Hindu philosophical tradition. Now, what I have done in this paper is to show how Hindu philosophical tradition has a concern for bioethics or bioethical issues. Taking some proof from the Vedas, the Upanishads and the Bhagavad Gita, these are the three basic texts in Hindu philosophical tradition, I have shown how the ancient thinkers and philosophers of Hindu tradition talked about bioethical issues. And also I made uh, some attempt to include uh, Jainism and Buddhism also. They, though they are strictly, they don't belong to Hindu philosophical tradition, but they came as a reaction to Hindu philosophy. So I included that also. And uh, the purpose is to show that the bioethical issues could be viewed from cross-cultural understanding. That is my main concern. That is, uh, throughout the globe, philosophers, scientists, the spiritualists, and religious thinkers have talked about these issues in detail. Now, actually I start my paper with a quotation from Daryl Mazur, because he has influenced me a lot, especially in the context of bioethics. So I would like to give a beautiful quotation of uh, Dermaser. He says, bioethics is a love of life. This is a very fascinating term, love of life, reflecting the hope that bioethics should value life in a process involving emotions and rationality. I think this is a very good definition for bioethics. And he says how this could be viewed from different disciplines. He says, the concept of bioethics can be seen in literature, art, music, culture, philosophy, and religion. So this means, bioethics has an application towards various disciplines. And also, he says that every culture has developed bioethics. Whether it is uh, Indian culture or Western culture, there is a concern for bioethics. And also, we should keep in mind that for the sustainable future, we have to promote uh, this uh, kind of maturity. Now, one of the important aspects of bioethics is to develop the transdisciplinary content knowledge. This, I think, is very important because we no more can be tied to one particular discipline. That should be what is called transdisciplinary content or interdisciplinary understanding which can pave the way for understanding the concept of bioethics. And I feel that also in bioethics, understanding cultural diversity and values are more important. We may be different with regard to the practice of our culture because if you take India, for example, it is a multicultural society. But in spite of that, there is a uh, unity among uh, ourselves especially in the context of bioethics. And also, in the cross-cultural bioethics, different traditions can be compared. This is one of my major objectives. That is, the cross-cultural bioethics has to be emerged. This is possible provided we compare the different uh, religious or philosophical traditions. Now, your respect for life is something which is emphasized in bioethics. And this is also emphasized here by the cross-cultural bioethical theories, both in Hindu and Western philosophical tradition. Now it is said in Hindu philosophy that goal of life is completed only human beings serve as the custodian of nature. Human beings should think that they are the custodian and which means they have to preserve the nature for the future. And not only in nature, but also and inanimate things. This has been emphasized in, especially in the Jaina tradition, where the inanimate uh, play a dominant role. So human beings have to 
not only take care of nature but also the inner image. If you take uh, Hindu philosophical tradition, there is always the preservation of forest. For example, it is said in Hindu tradition that uh, the people of the hills saw the interrelationship between the forest cover and ecological stabilization. Especially the tribes and the native people are very much concerned about uh, the forest uh, living and in fact they are the one I would say preserve the nature. And as a result of this, the policy makers, for example the government of India has understood the significance of the forest and it now says that it is uh, not production centers but the protection center. So that is a shift from what we call production center to protection center. And also, the contribution of the indigenous people and the natives uh, play a significant role in the preservation of forest. And also for the sustainable development, it is a need of the hour to preserve the forest. And I would like to relate this with uh, the Union Commission of uh, Environmental and Development, which has put forward the concept of uh, sustainable development in the following statement. It says, development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generation to meet their own deeds. And also, it is said that uh, the unsustainable pattern of development pursued by nations without taking into consideration its environmental impacts and responsibility to the future generation are alarming. And in India now, at least we are aware of this uh, important aspect because we have one act and one life. In fact, Meiser used to ask this question, what do we leave for our future generation? So, the need of our hour to protect the earth because we have only one life and the concept of sustainable development is explained by these two concepts in Indian context. One is, concept one, needs in particular the essential needs of the world for to which overriding priority should be given and secondly, the limitation in the environment's ability to meet the present for the and the future needs. And human beings, as the constituent of the environment, interacts continuously with plants, animals, and non-living beings such as light, temperature, water, soil, etc. And we are also influencing our environment by our social attitude such as uh, land use, transportation, disposal of waste and misuse of resources. And Hindu philosophy talks about uh, the concept of dharma. The word dharma is a Sanskrit word. It means virtue. The, the literal meaning of the word means virtue. And it says, it recognizes the sustainability of everything. The whole Indian philosophical tradition, Hindu philosophical tradition centers on this basic point, namely the concept of dharma. So the concept of dharma recognizes the sustainability of everything and also human beings have indebtedness to other human beings. This is the most important aspect. We have the responsibility towards other human beings and the life forms on earth. And also we must remember that ancient sages have lived a harmonious life and the text like Bhagavad Gita, very important text for Hindus, says that members of the society has to perform duty towards nature. This is known as Swadharma, because in Hindu tradition we talk about various dharmas, Swadharma, Raja Dharma, etc. The Swadharma means, this also is Sanskrit, it means one's own dharma. That is what one should do. This is emphasized now in Swadharma, we also talk about how the individual should have a responsibility towards nature. So the concept of Swadharma has been now uh, redefined in Indian context. The hermeneutical definition of Sodharma includes man's or human beings responsible towards nature. Once it was believed that Sodharma means performing one's own duty because the Hindu society is classified into four categories and each category has to perform one's responsibility that is uh, given to him or her. But now the concept of Sodharma is redefined in the sense that it also talks about the human beings concerned for the nature. And also, the glory of peace is very much emphasized in a, a Hindu philosophical tradition. And based on this, in fact, we have started, uh, uh, you know, the Chipko movement, the well-known movement by Bhagavan and others. 
So the ancient tradition, especially in the Rig Veda, it is said, trees are life, good people who care for others. So the trees take care of the other human beings. They have to keep standing in the sun, but they give shade to others. Whatever fruits they bear, they do not themselves, but give them to others. How kind they are. This is what is reflected in Rig Veda. And also it is said that the customs and culture, moral and ethical values are significant in Hindu philosophical context. And different religious as well as philosophical tradition explain the significance of uh, nature, not only Hindu philosophy, all the philosophies, all the religious philosophy talk about the significance of nature. And it is said in uh, uh, philosophy that uh, the nature is a bunch of Bhutas, that is five great elements. And also it is believed that there is an interconnection between internal and external environments. And the micro and macro environment also play a dominant role in external environment. And we believe in the, the concept of trinity, namely man, nature and society triangle relationship. In fact, there are thinkers like Raimundo Padikar, a well-known philosopher and religious thinker, who said that uh, that is what is called the cosmotheentric vision. This means human beings, nature and God are interrelated. So man's participation is very important and also the care and concern. This, which means man has to, human beings must take care of uh, nature and also he, he or she must have a concern for the nature. And the concept of Rita, Rita is another beautiful concept which is emphasized in Hindu philosophical tradition. The concept of Rita means uh, moral order in the universe. That is, there is a natural moral order in the universe and human beings have no right to disturb this moral order. This is emphasized in one of the ancient Vedas, that is namely Rig Veda. And according to this uh, Rita, God created the world. So there is no conflict between spiritualism and religion uh, and uh, uh, science in Hindu philosophical tradition. It believes that God created the world by dismembering, dismembering the cosmic giant. And in fact it is said, God, that is uh, in Purusha Shukta, that is in uh, Rig Veda, he said, he represents uh, the entire cosmos. For example, the moon was born from his mind, his eyes are birthed to the sun, the sky arose from his head. This is how it is uh, explained in Purusha Sukta of the Rig Veda. And also, ancient uh, philosophers took care of uh, the sacred groves. They are small patches of forest left untouched and protected by the local inhabitants. And also the existence of these groves play a vital role in the preservation of uh, species diversity and they also enrich with the valuable medicinal local flora and fauna and this enriched ecosystem assists to retain subsoil water during drought season. So what I'm trying to say is if you look at uh, the uh, ancient uh, philosophical uh, systems we are able to see how they had a concern for nature and how they preserved uh, the nature. And similarly, now in India we are talking about a rain harvesting system which is very famous and nowadays we don't give uh, permission to construct houses without this uh, uh, rain, I mean this system, rain harvesting system. This is emphasized in all uh, town planning and all that. One. But if you look at the ancient systems, we see how uh, we have practiced this method. So there is a traditional practice of water harvesting systems which we could uh, see in the Indian uh, ancient uh, tradition. For example, during king's rule, in ancient India, like lakes and ponds were excavated and uh, uh, to preserve water and conserve water. Tanks were built near the temples because in every temple there is a tank to preserve water and rainwater draining channels were linked to temple tanks in such a way that the rainwater never been drained by elsewhere. And uh, I, I, I used to two methodologies. One is the ancient methodology practiced by two great uh, thinkers. One is Shankara and Ramanja. They belong to the traditional school of uh, Indian philosophy. And also I used to two methodologies of uh, Rabindranath Tagore and Gandhi from the contemporary side, how they had a uh, concern for uh, bioethics. Now Shankara, the ancient philosopher, Hindu philosopher or Indian philosopher, he talked about what is known as uh, uh, the holistic life. 
which means the man uh, nature relation was very much uh, emphasized by the uh, philosophy of Advaita. And also, we have another important thinker, Ramanuja, who talked about uh, human being, God, nature. This, uh, this triangle relation is very much emphasized by a thinker called Ramanuja. So, in Hindu philosophy, people offered worship to land, river, trees, uh, animals, and birds. And this is also known as uh, the concept of Vashudeva Kudumbagam in Sanskrit. Sorry, once again, I'm using a Sanskrit word, but the word means that the world is a uh, one. The entire the world, the entire world is one family. This is what is emphasized in Indian philosophical tradition. And similarly, if you come to Buddhist philosophy, it also talks about uh, the interrelatedness of nature and belief through non-violence. The concept of non-violence is very much emphasized in uh, the Buddhist philosophy, of course, in the Hindu tradition also. Then similarly, if you look at uh, how the mountains were preserved, very good example is the India, Japan, and Sri Lanka, where we see the philosophical significance and also the social significance of the mountains, which are always considered as sacred. And if you come to Jaina philosophy, another important school of philosophy in India, which has emerged uh, during Mahavira's uh, period, it also talks about uh, Ahimsa and respect for all living beings. And also, non living were preserved in, during the Jaina philosophy. In fact, uh, their philosophy can be uh, uh, paraphrased in one quotation, nature is viewed as a living organism. This is what uh, Jainism practiced. And also, I said that, that there are two contemporary thinkers whom I am going to discuss very briefly. Very, very briefly. One is Gandhi and another is Tagore, who had a concern for nature. Of course, here the dignity and responsibility is very much emphasized. Because it is said that every individual and every creature has intrinsic dignity and inalienable rights and each one of them has an inescapable responsibility what it is. Which means we cannot escape by saying that it is not my res responsibility. So we have inescapable responsibility which means each and every individual has a responsibility towards uh, nature and responsibility towards other human beings. This is the first priority and second is nature, uh, living and non-living. Here three concepts are very important. One is uh, bioethics, biosafety and the ethical implications of the genetic engineering are important in the contemporary society and many Indian philosophers have talked about that. And what is important is all the time we are talking about this in detail. So theoretical discussion is going on but practically speaking we are not done uh, much. So theoretical discussion of these issues will not solve the problem. So the solution to the problem lies in application of the theories because we have got plenty of theories but we don't apply these theories to our practical life. Uh, to be formulated to the issues and this is possible only through, I mean, since I am a philosopher I say that it is possible through the help of philosophers. It is problems connected with man and nature, individual action is necessary prerequisite for developing a better world. So individual shortcomings can destroy harmony and peace of any relationship, but collectively they can have global consequences. I may think that I am doing very little harm to nature, but if every individual performs the same act, then it will have global consequences. That means the responsibility lies with each and every individual. So we have developed the concept known as biophilia. Now what do we mean by biophilia? It is a conception which shows there is an innate emotional affiliation. That's why in India, in the Chippo movement, uh, people embrace the trees. This is nothing but showing the emotional affiliation of human beings to other living beings like trees and other human beings, of course. So a respect for life is emphasized by many contemporary thinkers. And from the western side, one important thinker is Leopold, I skip this quotation, and he made a distinction between uh, shallow and deep ecology. The very important distinction, he played a vital role in uh, emphasizing the importance of bioethics. And he says shallow ecology as a concern only for human beings and nature, but uh, the deep ecology talks about the entire cosmos. So what we need, what is the need of the ever? The need of the ever is there should be a paradigm shift. What is this paradigm shift? From anthropocentric ethics, we have to move towards uh, ecocentric ethics. And this is also known as responsibility ethics. In fact, 
Uh, if you take the Kant for example, talk, Kant talked about anthropocentric ethics, though it was uh, very much appreciated, though it is something excellent. Later, Hans Jonas has developed what is known as responsibility ethics. The responsibility ethics has a concern for the entire cosmos. So it is a need of the hour to take a shift from anthropocentric ethics to ego ethics. And this ethics is uh, ecocentric ethics, so this paradigm shift is very much essential. And the relevance of Gandhi is very much uh, important in this context, though Gandhi has not uh, written uh, specifically on environmental issues. From his philosophy, one can cut out the, uh, his uh, understanding of ecology and how we can talk about environmental ethics. Because in his philosophy, the end justify means equality, social, economic, and trusteeship is something very important. In a trusteeship, nobody can uh, own anything, he can preserve something for the future. So, the concept of tr trusteeship is important. And also, Gandhi talked about uh, decentralized democracy and Punjab system. And there are various influences. Mahatma Gandhi was very much influenced by not only Indian tradition, but also by the Christian tradition and thinkers. So, uh, and also Jaina tradition have made a tremendous impact on him. And he has talked about uh, the ecocentrism where the ecosystem, both organic and uh, inorganic, was taken into account. And he also talked about the traditional values and uh, responsibility ethics, and I skip some of this. And uh, one important aspect of uh, Gandhian philosophy is, he said uh, that uh, there should be a distinction between self-interest and selfishness. Now, in the case of self-interest, that is there is uh, the need for uh, legitimate needs, but selfishness is nothing but illegitimate greed. And Gandhi is uh, vehemently opposing this uh, selfishness or uh, what we call the illegitimate uh, uh, greed. And he also strongly condemned the cultural de uh, degradation and moral decadence. And he wanted the production by masses and not mass production. This is one of the very important uh, uh, aspects of Gandhian understanding because he was more concerned about uh, the, uh, the production by the masses. And I'll skip this and then uh, I'll just skip this. Now, I go to Tagore. Tagore is another influencing philosopher in Indian context who has talked about uh, the bioethical or environmental issues in detail. And he shows that how nature and human being, uh, human being are nothing but the part of the integral, uh, integral part of the supreme, which means there is a triadic relation which I emphasized in the beginning itself. So nature and human being play a significant role in understanding the supreme nature. If you want to know the supreme nature or supreme being, then one should know the interrelation that exists between nature and human beings. And also Tagore said that uh, we should show our love and respect to forests, rivers and mountains. And then there is an interdependence of uh, nature and humanity. And he considered life as something divine. Thus, each and every individual, according to Tagore, has a divinity. That divinity can be known or can be understood, provided you love the other human beings. And in Gitanjali, he says, a very beautiful quotation, the same stream of life that through my, that runs through my veins and day runs through, that is through, through the world. And this is nothing but the dances in rhythmic measures. And he is, uh, he, well, you know, the concept of uh, uh, Shantini Kajan, which has developed. Shantini Kajan, Shantini Kajan is a place where there is a man-nature relationship, where the teaching methods are different, etc. And recently it has been pointed out by uh, many Indian scientists that there is a 10% increase in rainfall and raise in temperatures precipitated by the climate change. So the consequences of such a phenomena would include frequent flooding of wetlands and lengthy droughts. And uh, one of the recent uh, US ecologists who visited uh, uh, Chennai, uh, she said, she said that uh, biodiversity was by and large intact. This is a very important uh, uh, contribution or a very important significant contribution which she made. She said the biodiversity by, uh, by and large intact in spite of the onslaught of development, it was difficult to hazard a guess on how long these ecosystems would be survived if the sustainable use strategy could not be evolved. 
our uh, leading scientist uh, who is responsible for uh, green revolution in india dr m s swaminathan he says that wetland conservation efforts in the indian situation need to combine social sustainability so that this is what the social sustainability is something which we are trying to achieve in terms of livelihood with the environmental sustainability so i conclude by saying that there is a need for us to develop the universal ethics now what is the universal ethics the basic principle of ethics still is love thy neighbor as thyself so the universal ethics is the synthesis of different religious traditions and the aspects of biological social and spiritual heritage that we have so a new direction for understanding the individual and social relation and also we should pave the way for intercultural understanding and then my conclusions are this one is that should be what is called as the harmony with nature then there should be peaceful coexistence then sustainable development then appreciation of nature and preservation for the future and traditional and indigenous values love towards the entire cosmos involvement of the community then responsibility and commitment and finally intercultural understanding thank you thank you very much are there any comments or questions irena just a quick comment uh, i'd like to mention that the indigenous australians the first nation people yeah. they believe they belong to land they belong to country and they looked after the australia for at least 60000 years in the driest continent in the world when the newcomers came they said the land belongs to us and do you know what sort of problems we've been having <laughs> uh in india also especially the tribal people so in the in the, in the in the in the name of development so we try to unfortunately we try to destroy the lands of uh, the tribals and we say that we will give you provide you all uh, uh, development but uh, the the people are not ready to accept that so in fact uh, i'll give one example in kerala you must be knowing the southern part of india where uh, uh, the, the 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 electricity power uh, was uh, very insufficient and they were trying to uh, destroy a lot of forest this is known as silent valley project and the indigenous people as well as the local people they said we don't want that project at all so this means uh, there is always uh, a tension between the development and uh, the sustainability or the preservation of uh, nature but uh, this conflicts i think uh, uh, will go on i mean from the practical side this is what i would like to say yeah yes yeah see yoshi please my name is tsuyoshi i will come in the bus to japan so <coughs> i have one recommendation and two uh, question i want to recommend one excellent book The title is Chronicle of Plants Which Have Desire, written by Professor Fukuoka, excellent researcher. And he says, plants has big, extremely big desire, like human, like animals. So they are fighting against each other every day, and plants don't want to give us. the how beautiful flowers they don't want to give us pleasure so and the uh, uh, forest need doesn't need oxygen we need oxygen they will give us oxygen so it's a kind of extinct system <coughs> and two um, questions one is bhagavad gita yeah. You, yeah so does it bhagavad gita includes the bioethics as medical ethics one question and the second question uh, lab theory uh dr mason is and you mentioned so uh, in fact the world the world is messy so 
big contradiction. Uh, everyday murder, uh, crime, so war, terrorism, many bad things. So do you think that love theory can save or settle our view contradiction? Only yes or no is. <laughs> Uh, yeah, first of all, like, thank you for your recommendation. I definitely agree with the book. Now, with regard to Bhagavad Gita, now that text uh, talks about uh, the interrelation that exists between human beings, <coughs> nature, and God. Okay. So I I don't know where um, have any reference which uh, can help you to show how it talks about medical ethics. It is more concerned about uh, the bioethical issues. But this also, we can draw the implication from them. We can't say that all these issues were anticipated by our ancient thinkers. No, I'm not arguing like that. I'm trying to cull out the ideas which is available in the text and relate it from uh, uh, the text to our present situation and see how the traditional values are important. And secondly, uh, yeah, uh, bioethics is nothing but uh, love thy neighbor as thyself. So, once we understand the meaning of this concept, the true meaning in our inner meaning of the concept, then perhaps uh, there will not be any misunderstanding of because human dignity, as I said in my paper, the human dignity, the dignity is something which we have to preserve, which we have to appreciate, which we have to evaluate. But most of the time, we think that uh, uh, we alone are the survivors. We don't take into account uh, the concept of other. Uh, this is a major problem. Uh, the concept of other is very much uh, emphasized, for example, in uh, Buddhist uh, tradition. So this, uh, if you understand, that's why we say non-violence is the only uh, way of life, the only principle which can, which can uh, give uh, new, a new understanding for uh, the cosmos. Yeah. Uh, yeah I leave from Taiwan again. Okay. Thank you very much for your appreciation of the, the role of philosopher. You give it so high status uh, as a philosopher. I, uh, I thank you for that. But another thing is, uh, you seem to talk about, uh, uh, very much about the Hindu philosophy and the tradition. It seems that we have uh, some overlapping with the Chinese philosophy. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for that. But I would like to raise two uh, points here. I think ultimately, if you are right, that is biotic is a uh, local life, but the human people have more responsibility than that. Maybe two things. One is about uh, the saying that uh, uh, human life should be the custodian of nature. Okay. Maybe we need to do a little bit more, okay, say, because many of those uh, pollutions and making species dis become distinct are human actions, okay, because we use uh, too, too much, uh, exploit too much of the natural resources, the other species disappear because of us. So, we are not only a, a custodian of the nature, we should be a little bit further. We should serve some kind of a, a nurturer of nature. We have to make some balance that there is some defect in nature. Like we have some poor people, some vulnerable species. We have to help them. One thing. The other thing is more important because human beings are too numerous. Actually, we become a, a, a kind of burden of earth and a burden of all species. So we are talking about the bioethics of population. So as human beings, we should reflect a little bit more about that. We should limit our populations because uh, the earth cannot burden too much people. We have already passed the limits. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, we should think more about yeah, how to get our operation less. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very so much. Actually, <coughs> this was really a comment. But uh, what I would like to say is that uh, it is true that uh, Hindu religious tradition has a uh, affiliation towards the other religions. For example, uh, uh, Confucianism. 
and uh, Japanese uh, tradition. All this actually converge. I feel that uh, South Asian religions have some commonality where we talk about uh, is uh, uh, the triadic relationship. Is what I mean. Okay, Shamima. <laughs> Yes, mm, uh, uh, world uh, world is uh, uh, going faster, running faster. There is a technology, different level of technology, uh, uh, in in a reproductive technology. There is and uh, how the Hindu religion uh, in the philosophy which incorporated the um, reproductive technology uh, technology. That means uh, in reproductive technology there is the um, uh, surrogacy, there is the uh, sperm donation. How this uh, incorporate uh, by the Hindu uh, religion? This this things. Yeah. <coughs> now actually the Hindu tradition has uh, I would say has enlarged itself because uh, we also allow the surrogate mothers, for example, then sperm uh, donation. Everything is. Now, uh, allowed. Allowed the sense the religion uh, does not uh, put any restriction on that. Okay. What's the, uh, which philosophy this accepts? Uh, no, no, actually there is no reference to that. I must admit that. It is the, no reference. But you know, now Hindu uh, thinkers, the modern Hindu thinkers, they interpret uh, Hindu religious tradition in such a way that uh, Hindu philosophy can accommodate uh, surrogacy and uh, target mother and the concept of uh, you know sperm donation and all so it is widened because there is a lot of uh, interpretation that is going on we no more fully depend on the traditional uh, systems as it was given because these are some of the modern issues so what would be the uh, solution to this and uh, normally there is no objection by the the, the saints and sages you know the so called priest you no know? we have got a lot of uh, religious gurus or religious leaders they don't uh, deny that. They don't uh, say no to that. So this means it is allowed. And in fact, uh, many practice that. So th it is not uh, in contradiction to Hindu uh, way of life. OK. Can I, can I ask a question? Yeah, yeah, please. Yeah. Now, my name is uh, Tom Cook. I'm an English teacher in Osaka, uh, teaching at the university. And uh, I appreciate your Indian philosophy. My question is now with India, the changes that are taking place, agriculture, etc. Do you think that Indian philosophy will be able to keep India in a, in a relatively uh, philosophical position uh, versus the onslaught of the economic changes that are taking place there? Yeah, I feel, uh, as a philosopher, I would like to answer this question. I feel that uh, Indian philosophical tradition, I don't want to uh, say uh, that it is against this uh, development and all the things. So, this Indian philosophical tradition accepts uh, the modern development that are uh, taking place and there is a uh, place for the sustainable development. So, it accommodates everything, but at the same time, it says, be cautious. Don't be overpowered by this uh, uh, no, economic uh, prosperity alone. This is what uh, Gandhi has said. So we follow that principle. In fact, uh, I must say that uh, uh, there is uh, going back to Gandhi, Gandhian philosophy, which has got a practical application. Okay, uh, yeah. okay go on. Uh, just a beautiful mic. Okay. <laughs> um, I, I think I may have an issue with one of the things. I'm not sure the concept of trusteeship yeah. exists in, in some of the Indian you know, philosophies as much as a symbiotic or cosmos, cosmologist perspective. All idea of sacrifice, not sacrificing life, but sacrifice is accepting something much bigger and our very humble position with it in. To be a trustee, you have to be in control of things. So there is, I and you have differences over the Gandhian thing. I think Gandhi was a great political genius. But I also, and I've been on public platforms in India saying, Gandhi was also one of the biggest plagiarists in Indian 
contemporary life. Yeah. And that there is nothing, though no such thing as Gandhi philosophy, I do not know. Yeah. After one or two read lines, you find that he hasn't got any substance. As opposed to Tagore, Tagore never made a pretense of owning a philosophy. He always made reference to the great thinkers in Indian philosophy from whose he took ideas. Gandhi never made references. He simply takes the catchphrases of under of the many thousands of years of philosophers and puts them as his idea. And somehow, for some reason, Indian academics have created this idea of Gandhian philosophy. I have yet to understand what Gandhi philosophy is. There's no, I haven't seen anything original in it. So I you know, have that issue with you. Now. First question I forgot. Just put a uh, trust issue. Ah, trust issue, yeah. Trusteeship, uh, I think, is a concept which uh, Mahatma Gandhi has borrowed from Jainism. So that that, that is uh, the concept of uh, I mean, the trusteeship is something which uh, has been very much emphasized by the Mahavira, that is, the founder of uh, Jainism. And you are right with regard to your second question. No, Gandhi has not uh, or never acknowledged that he has taken. Uh, uh, what shall I say, uh, the clues from uh, different religious tradition. But uh, in only one place, he acknowledged the contribution made by the Jaina philosophy. In fact, he says uh, the Jaina's uh, Anekantavada is something which is very much uh, uh, essential for the present day religious crisis. So he says the plurality of religion is something which uh, he has borrowed it from uh, Jaina philosophy. But apart from that, he never, you are right, he never acknowledged that he has borrowed his ideas from the Vedas, Upanishads. But uh, he says he has been influenced by various religious religions, though he is not specifically mentioning that uh, this concept I have borrowed from this thing. But, uh, but uh, why is then Gandhian philosophy? Gandhi, uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, is not considered as a philosopher. No, we, we, I mean, as a philosopher, I would never consider him as a, as a philosopher. And if you go to uh, the political scientists, they are re ready to acknowledge him as a political thinker. But uh, what he has said about, uh, about life is something which is very much beneficial to philosophers. So we call him uh, uh, a philosopher. But philosophers strictly say that Gandhi is a non-academic philosopher. That's the distinction we are making. Okay, Miyako? And uh, you said that Hindu uh, respect the nature yeah. very much, but uh, we Japanese, uh, we Japanese, uh, uh, our religion maybe Shinto or uh, Buddhism mixture, <laughs> something like that. That we feel the nature more than respect, something like a spiritual spirituality, just like uh, Nether said that. That uh, we saw that something a God the river, uh, forest, or something like this. So, um, something that is uh, very similar to yeah, Hindu, definitely. but it's uh, different, I think. It is different. Yeah, yeah. One, yeah, yeah please. Uh, yeah. For example, river Ganges. Mm -hmm. No, you take, uh, I think you heard of the name uh, Ganges, river Ganges. It is something very sacred for all Indians. Okay. Mm -hmm. Then similarly, various mountains. Mm -hmm. huh? So that mountains are also sacred. So there are certain similarities between uh, mm -hmm. Hindu religious tradition and uh, Japanese mm -hmm. tradition because we consider nature as something sacred, pure, and it is something which we have to worship. Uh, Ravi, welcome. Hello. Oh. Sorry, who's our oh, Professor Uma? Yeah. Sorry, concerning the Surakit Mother in Hindus. I heard in Mahabharata, there is no... What, what I, I, please repeat. Yeah, concerning uh, Surakit Mahathir. Oh, sorry. In, in, in uh, Hindu philosophy. I heard from uh, Mahabharata, mm -hmm. there, are, there are two kings. Uh, first, uh, the King Santanu, uh, which uh, failed to give a birth of son. And then they asked uh, uh, Holy Sadis uh, to couple with uh, his wife. And then they got uh, three sons. And this three sons is regarded as son of Santanu. Also, uh, King Pandu, who failed to give birth, uh, and then they asked uh, uh, God or, 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 or uh, 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 Holy Sadis, and they, this uh, uh, children regarded as uh, son of Pandus. Is that so? Uh, 
uh, yeah, see, now, see, the problem is, uh, you finished, sir? Yes. Now, the, the problem is we are trying to look at the ancient tradition from what is available today. So, we can say it is similar to that. Uh, I mean. So, the surrogate mother in you is based on a uh, holy book of such as yeah. Mahabharata. Thank you. Yeah. Hello everybody, Ravi from Malaysia. Um, just a point of clarification uh, to uh, just Dave has mentioned. I don't think, I mean, I've been reading, I've been going to India quite regularly nowadays and I've been collecting books on Indian philosophy, especially on Gandhi. Actually, Gandhi never claimed himself to be a philosopher. It's others who claim, all right? Gandhi never claimed himself to be a Mahatma. It is others. So essentially, yes, I do understand that some of the verses, the quotations, and uh, you know the speeches come from different traditions, especially. Okay, so we need to acknowledge that. I don't think he's a plagiarist. All right, uh, I mean we plagiarize, all of us plagiarize so to, to one extent to another. All right, my question to you, uh, Prof, uh, is you know it's kind of mind-boggling when you come to you no know, when you think about India. India is a diverse society which embraces different sets of beliefs, religion, things of that sort. And how does India as a society embrace these different sets of you know, value system and moral reasoning and ethics uh, for them to look at issues like environment, like for example, issues of surrogacy, issues of end of life issues. You know, I, I know that for one, I attended a conference in India. They were talking about, you know, uh, euthanasia is, you know, is permitted in Jainism, like for example. Now, how do you have a law, or you know, how how does they? This is one of the problems that you know, place which I come from. <laughs> you know, we have problem of how to reconcile this. Thank you. Yeah, Hindu uh, philosophy or Indian philosophy since. Uh, it is based on uh, the plurality of cultures. We accommodate uh, everything under one umbrella. That uh, perhaps would solve many of the problems. And uh, see, this, especially this Jainism and Buddhism, they are very, I would say that they are uh, revolutionary moments in India. Okay. Because they came as a reaction to Hindu philosophy. Because especially uh, when Hindu philosophy was too much... Uh, uh, ritualistic and all, then these two religions have emerged. But uh, the, especially Jainism, Jainism talks about uh, the concept of uh, uh, surrogacy mother and then uh, other concepts also. The concept of uh, the concept of uh, salekana means uh, killing one's own self. That's also allowed. So uh, that means that one can one can f fast to death. So these are some of the concepts which has emerged in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Jainism and Buddhism. And uh, Jainism and Buddhism are the two philosophers which has talked about uh, the environmental issues in detail, more than Hindu philosophy. <coughs> but we place uh, everything under one umbrella. So perhaps uh, the reason is that you know, we are uh, pluralistic, <coughs> different cultures, plurality of cultures which has emerged in uh, different uh, uh, places and different regions, they preserve uh, the culture, one culture, one culture, Indian culture. Okay, thank you very thank much. You,